Hello and welcome to Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast, a podcast to inspire you about outdoor travel and activities in the UK and across the world. I'm Amy and thanks for listening to our latest episode. This episode features highlights from our recent Cicerone Live event with Cicerone author Mark Richards and Managing Director of Cumbria Tourism, Jill Haig. The event was to celebrate the new editions of Mark's classic Fell Ranger series, now officially called Walking the Lake District Fells, and we were also joined by Jill to talk about sustainable tourism and what visitors can do when they come to the Lake District this year. Both Mark and Jill are so passionate about sharing the Lake District and Cumbria with people and encouraging visitors to walk responsibly. Mark Richards is a countryman born and bred. After 14 years of dedicated research, living and working in Cumbria, the original Fell Ranger series was born and reflects his love of the magic of Fell country. Mark also has a fascination with pen and ink illustration, which later in life brought him to a friendship with Alfred Wainwright and an overwhelming desire to make his own illustrated guides. Always busy writing and promoting the landscape of Cumbria on many fronts, Mark has written several guides for Cicerone and now presents a regular podcast with a uniquely Cumbrian flavour, Country Stride. Jill Haig is the Managing Director at Cumbria Tourism, the county's official tourist destination management organisation. Jill joined Cumbria Tourism in 2017 following her previous role as Director of Marketing and Recruitment at the University of Cumbria. Her current job is a dream come true. For Jill, childhood family holidays, caravanning throughout the county, climbing the hills and sailing the lakes with her parents and brothers, sowed the seas for a lifelong love affair with the county that she is now proud to share with others. The eight new Walking the Lake District Fells guidebooks are centred on eight different Lake District valleys. Borrowdale, Buttermere, Coniston, Keswick, Langdale, Mardale in the Far East, Patterdale and Wasdale. Updated, restyled and completed over four years, all eight guidebooks are now available on the Cicerone website. Get a 25% discount on any or all of the guidebooks by typing in FELRANGER25 at the checkout. That's FELRANGER with a capital F, 25. You can also use our new for old scheme to trade in your old copies of the Fell Ranger books for the new editions. Now, Hannah is off this week, so I thought it would be a brilliant opportunity to have a chat with Natalie Simpson, a fellow in-house editor at Cicerone, who oversaw the editorial process of the new Fell Ranger series and really knows these guidebooks inside out. Hi, Natalie. Hello. Now, it's quite funny to actually talk to you and not ask how are the Fell Rangers going? Because I know for as long as I've been at Cicero and you've been working on these new editions. So how does it feel now they're finally done? It's a little bit strange because as you say, they've been a big part of my life for quite a long time, but it's wonderful to see them in print. And hopefully I speak for all the team and I say we're really chuffed with how they've come together. And I'm, I'm looking forward to using them on the fells as soon as the lockdown restrictions are lifted. And I know that you have been climbing the fell ranges, haven't you? You've been trying to complete them and tick them off and walk those routes. I have indeed, yes. I've got about 12 or 16 left, which I'm hoping to complete this summer. Um, quite a few of them are the extra ones that are not in the Wainwright Guides, the ones kind of around Corny Fell and Burka. So that's my home territory, really. So it'll be nice and easy, hopefully, to get up them in the near future. <laughs> And you are based in South Cumbria, aren't you? So the Coniston book is probably the closest to you. And that was one of the final two that you copy edited yourself. So was it nice to kind of dig into those mountains that you know so well already? Yes, it was lovely to work particularly on that that particular volume as it is very familiar to me and that the mountains that I've kind of grown up with and I've walked and yeah, it was really nice to revisit them through the books. So you grew up loving that original series of books by Mark Richards. And what is it about them that you think is so special? Yeah, I I gained the whole collection prior to coming to work at Cicerone. And I just find them really useful because they are so comprehensive. They've got such a wide selection of routes, all described kind of concisely, but with enough detail to follow them. And it's great for choosing the route that you want. I like the fact that the maps show routes that aren't always on the OS maps and just having that whole selection in front of me and all of the information I need about the terrain, the different conditions I'm likely to encounter, it's perfect for planning. What do you think the biggest, what was the biggest challenge with with doing the new additions? I think keeping them um, smaller was quite a challenge in that we didn't want to lose any of the wonderful content 
but we did have to weigh that against the practicalities of you're going to have to carry this book up a hill. For that reason, some panoramas have been moved onto the Cicerone website, which frees up a lot of weight in the guide as they, they, they took up several pages, sort of, I don't know, around 60 pages per volume. But it means that readers can still access them if they want them online and they still have this wonderful resource of all Mark's beautiful sketch panoramas from the summits, whereas we've only included a few key ones in each guidebook. One of the real beauties of the Fell Ranger books are Mark's illustrations, aren't they? And I think it's so lovely that you decided as a team to keep them in. Yes, we've kept all of the sketch topos and a handful of the panoramas. Um, and it is lovely because Mark's love of the Fells just shines through in all his work, whether it's his words or his illustrations. And it's really nice to have them to accompany the text. We tried to present a little bit more sort of at a glance information to help you plan your day and choose your route. So for each fell, we've got an opening panel with start points where you might uh, park and climb it from, fells you could link it with in a longer ridge route and that kind of thing. So it just ties everything together a little bit more. And then we've got appendices as a little bit of extra information about the valley bases public transport, that kind of thing, you know, the practical side, if you're visiting the lakes or trying to get around. So it's all been geared towards ensuring sort of maximum usability, making it really friendly and really helpful when you're out um, out and about on the hills. I mean, we talk about it quite a bit in the event, the fell friendly routes, that's a new addition to these books. And I think that's really important to include. And I mean, the fell rangers naturally spread people across the fells rather than going up the same route just by offering you know seven or eight different routes for each fell but I think identifying the fell friendly one I think is brilliant. Yeah it's really really helpful to give people who want to walk consciously and carefully that option of choosing a route that's going to be less vulnerable to erosion and as you say you know the fact that there are so many routes to choose from does help to spread people out. I know some walkers myself included I tend to prefer the quieter routes I quite like that feeling of having the mountain to myself. So you have options for those kind of people. It's quite nice as well because we have got that extra area that isn't included in, say, the Wainwright guides, Burka and Corny, and that is a quieter corner of the lakes. It might not be as spectacular in terms of sort of rockiness or drama, but it has some great views and it's a really nice place. I spent a lot of time there in between the lockdowns when we were allowed out. The lakes were very, very busy, but we did find some lovely routes that were far quieter in the southwest of the lakes and often on the fringes of the National Park, you get those quieter areas. So where are you, because you've got, do you say you've got 12 or 14 left to do? Yeah, somewhat, I'm not entirely certain, but it's between 12 and 16, I think, of the Fell Rangers. So when, when we're all allowed out again, where do you think you're heading first? Where's your next Fell Ranger going to be? I think I'm probably going to head round sort of Burka and Corny again. I think it's the Corny Fell ones I have yet to do. And I kind of need a gentle introduction because I have one or two big ones left up at Buttermere. So I need to get my fell legs back on and get back to full fitness before I take on some of the big ones. Well, uh, thank you, Natalie, for coming to talk to me about the Fell Rangers. And I know it's been a huge project for you over four years, kind of managing this. And it must be so satisfying to see all eight on the shelf. Um, I don't, have you seen them all together yet? I haven't actually seen the whole set of eight of them together, although I've seen all of the advanced copies. But it'll be wonderful to see them on the shelf um, and to have that resource. Like I'm sure even more so for Mark, because he has put so many years into them. But they have taken up sort of four years of my time. And it's, it's been wonderful to see them develop and to see the final product that's a product of so many people's involvement. I mean, especially Mark, obviously, but then... The edit team, um, Lois and Robin, who did the design, Caroline in-house, Liz Lamar, the proofreader. Everything's just come together to make these wonderful books. I, I hope everybody has great adventures with them. That's what they're there for. And can I ask, um, before I let you get on, what are you working on now, Natalie? I have been working on Trekking in the Vanois, which is a guide to the Tour of the Vanois and the Tour de Glacier de Vanois in the French Vanois National Park. So it's a bit of a change. It's big mountains, blue skies in the photographs anyway. And it's by long-standing Cicerone author, the wonderful Kev Reynolds, and also Jonathan Williams, our in-house author and CEO of Cicerone. So um, it's a little bit different from Fell Ranger, 
but it's always nice to have different titles. That's one of the good things about this job, the variety of, of different books you get to work on. Obviously, I'm intimately familiar with the lakes, but I've never been to the Vanuas. It's one to add to my bucket list. And you do get a growing list of places you want to go. <laughs> so, Mark, I know that working at Cicero, a lot of people love the original Fell Ranger series. But for people who haven't come across the series before, could you explain the vision for the series and what they cover? Right. Well, of course, this is the product of 20 years devoted research. Although the guidebooks, the new series, have emerged over the last two years, we have uh, developed this work. I've certainly developed the work for over a long period of time. Originally, I was very much influenced by Wainwright and so forth. I looked at it geographically uh, as the mountain ranges, and that's where the word fell ranger derives. But now we've realised very naturally and sensibly uh, that people walk on the fells and they approach from the valleys and so they at their their visitor and tourism perspective is as from the main valleys so we've made the whole series we've revitalized it reinvigorated it made it more pertinent to to today and a new appetite for adventure but sound advice so it's all built around the valleys the main ones there like Borrowdale, Langdale, uh, Buttermere, Coniston, Patterdale, Wasdale you name it people come to these areas and they recognize them they're like the hallmarks of what the Lake District's all about and so we have uh, as a team I feel I'm part of a team with Cicerone have brought a new vigor to this whole thing but it's very much geared to introducing people to the liberty, a, a responsible liberty to the fells. So there we have eight guidebooks, very pertinent. You drive into Keswick and you know where to go. Uh, so, in fact, if you come to Keswick, you immediately have got several volumes to at your disposal, which is marvellous. Um, but it certainly gives you scope to think much more with much more intelligence, give you the liberty to be to discover routes and not follow the crowd. And we've made a conscious effort to make them special. And I think an important thing to point out is that if uh, people are familiar with the series and have used the older books, these are a, a smaller size than the standard Cicero and Guidebook size now. I, I, it's, it, this is really strange. Um, as an author who's written many guides over the years, when I do a book, it gets edited, it gets completed and published, and I naturally move on to the next um, book. And my mind is, you know, rather like Wainwright, you, the difference between one volume and the next one is filling the pipe with more tobacco. But with me, I'm moving on. But this time, yesterday, I took the Mardale volume out and went to Arthur's Pike and Bonscale Pike, and I was amazed how efficient it was. Uh, I, I carry it, bring it out of the pocket just when I wanted, and I could pinpoint where I was. Um, I know I've researched all the routes, but you come back, I, actually that um, bond scale pike had been there for nine years. So a little bit of vagueness as to where you would break off the ridge to go down to how town, but the guidebook gave me it exactly. Uh, and so that's very encouraging. And it's really as much as, uh, okay, I did the research, put it together, the artwork and so forth. But it's the refinement, that's the, the ref editorial refinements that have come into this. First with Lois Sparling and then with uh, Nat Natalie Simpson. Excellent editing. So one of the main additions to these new books is a fell-friendly route for each hill, which is the one that is least vulnerable to erosion or that is reinforced by Fix the Fells or something like that. So, yeah, I wonder, Mark, if you could tell us about the decision to include those and why it's important to you to include them. We live in a different age and the sheer number of people who have over the last 50 years ventured on the fells have made a big impact. And I was very aware of this. Some fells, like dear little Armboss Fell, are almost forgotten gems that people are unaware of. Many fells are hugely popular and overpopular in certain respects and people tend to follow the herd and put enormous pressure on the infrastructure of the paths themselves and have to be constantly maintained and improved just to keep them able to cope with uh, the sheer volume uh, and uh, well i can i can come up with innumerable examples but if you uh, people who go up score fell up uh, lingmail gill 
a huge amount of effort has been put on that path, but it takes us a real pounding. But you can break up and go up onto Ling Mel, and that is a wonderful way up to gain Ling Mel coal. It's peerless, as it were, by comparison. Uh, although you look down Piers Gill, uh, it is peerless as an alternative to going up the Hollowstones Way where everybody is, and it can take the pressure. So there are different places that can take more wear and tear. And I think it's lovely that I, I want this series to belong to every walker. It's not me or Cicero, it's the walker. And I, I want the walkers to feel that they can communicate with us and tell us what they feel is the current fell-friendly route for any one fell. And then we can all judge if we need to switch from one route to another. And, and it's this being light on the feet ability of this new Fell Ranger series to be responsive that I think is going to be so instrumental in serving the area in a very durable and healthy, sustainable way. I think it's already doing that there, isn't it, in a way by offering so many routes for one or for each hill. You know, it is all the fells and all the routes, that's the tagline, so that people will spread out quite naturally, I think. Hopefully. Um, yeah, a lot of people don't think about taking a different route. Uh, and of course, the, the notion of all the routes is, is almost uh, a strange idea, because <laughs> once you get the feeling of the liberty that the guidebooks open, you actually can start fell wandering and discovering your own ways. I have a vivid memory of Middlestead's Gill being up on the fell there in a thunderstorm and racing down <laughs> this side Middlestead's Gill, because of course, when the weather strikes, Knowing an efficient way down is as much of an importance as knowing the ways up. Absolutely, yeah. And does it feel rewarding to um, repackage these for the needs of the current walker? Oh, this is the most, it's uplifting and stimulating. It's where I hoped it would be when I started the 20 odd years ago. That's when the seeds of this idea struck me. And of course, it, it goes back to the early 1970s when I used to walk with Wainwright. The, the sense that uh, I said to him, I remember saying to him that we were birds of the feather uh, and he agreed with me because of our shared love of pen and ink drawing and walking on the fells. From two completely different backgrounds, two different aspirations, I was this pupil. But I think we now got to a point where what, I've, what we as a, a body of a team in Cicerone and myself are offering something very special. And it needs to be 3D, uh, just not everybody's able to go with a map but they certainly need to because we, of course, so many people now just go up with a smartphone and they, they haven't got the reference to make sensible decisions. And that's one of the ingredients of this book. You've got to know when to backtrack. Like when I said about the thunderstorm, you've got to know when to go back and where to go back. The hills and the fells are a dynamic and quite fearful environment for many newbie walkers. People who get used to it, learn about it. I've never, had an accident in the fells. Lucky old me, and I'm touching wood even now. But that's only because I've learnt the caution of the fells. And, and this is one of the things I hope the series will teach people how to be wise when they're there, make the right decisions. Definitely. There will be people who have never been to the Lake District before. Um, this is great for discovering if you're a, a new fell walker. It really provides you with all the tools you need. I think as well, myself as a more experienced fell walker, having grown up in the Lake District, these books provide you with everything you need to explore the same mountain in a different way and rediscover different routes. So I think there really is something for everyone with these. We know that people go out and bag Wainwrights, and you can also do that with the fell rangers and get them signed off. And on the Cicerone website, uh, we provide the kind of tick sheets for that. But for you, Mark, is it about ticking off the fells or is it about exploring the new routes up the same ones? I actually left off five Wainwright because I didn't feel they even warranted identifying but there are 19 new in effect fell ranges but I've I've never climbed a Wainwright in my life as it were. The historic countryman's name for every fell that described it as either Red Pike or Dolly Wagon Pike as it were. Those are the names that are enigmatic and most meaningful. And I think if people climb the Lakeland Fells, I think that's what they should be doing. The Lake District Fells are, are what it's all about. AW has had a wonderful run and it's, it's in the history books like William Wordsworth, as it were. 
but we've we've now got to approach the outdoors in a different sort of way but we won't be able to lots of people I, I met a couple of ladies yesterday who were saying they were so grateful for having the guidebooks that got them to places they didn't think of ever going to before and ticking off lists enables them to do that so i have no qualms about people doing that and of course although i, I i've never climbed a particular style of fellow burkitt or whatever um i've done it the other way because i've been researching them in fine detail so i've inevitably gone up everyone and multiple ways up as well so i bagged them by every possible and a few unconceivable ways as well i've got some bad memories of going up completely the wrong way <laughs> that never got into the guide <laughs> anyway it was it's been a wonderful process well, it's eight new guidebooks. It has been a four-year process putting those yeah. together. And then all your years before that, doing the original series. And I imagine a lot of time in between, you know, thinking and deciding what to do next. So, yeah, it's a huge achievement. I think it's a huge achievement for everybody. I, I'm very proud of what everybody's done. Lois Sparling. And I must accredit Tim Thornton, and her partner, for coming up with the name Fail Friendly. I come up with the idea of an idea of it. And he just happened to say, well, they're Fail Friendly routes. I thought bang on we'll go for that i think so many people have contributed there's been seb editors there's proofreading excellent work that all plays into it and it is an ongoing process so i think we all should be proud of ourselves and um, as long as i can i've got legs to walk i will be updating this series with great vigor and enthusiasm i, I love it to bits thank you thank you for sharing that with us mark and you know it's lovely to be able to celebrate them uh, with you Hi, Jill. Hi. So I want to talk to you about, obviously, Mark's uh, guidebooks provide you with everything you need to know for actually going up the fells. Um, but I'd like to talk about visitors coming to Cumbria and I suppose the wider impacts of tourism. So the Lake District is a hugely popular area that attracts millions of visitors every year. And we know that tourism has a massive impact on the Cumbrian economy and, you know, it has a positive and negative impact. So I thought we'd start with the positives and what are the main benefits of tourism to the Lake District? I think, first of all, can I just say, Mark, congratulations. And every time I speak to you, you, you inspire, you are so positive and, you know, your, your passion and your love for the county and for the walking inspires everybody else as well. So I'll certainly be picking up the guides and thank you for them as well and helping me to, to find my way through. The positives are, are vast, aren't they? We're a rural county and, um, you know, like many, somewhere like Cornwall would probably be similar. Where would we be as a county in terms of our economy if it wasn't for the tourism industry? So we're hugely grateful for the fact that so many people do want to come and spend time here and spend money here. And I think what's really interesting about the makeup of Cumbria's tourism industry is we're not made up of big multinational companies. These are often family businesses. You know, it's a real opportunity for people for startup businesses. One of the things that I also think that we sometimes overlook as a community is how lucky we are to live and work in a place that has these amazing mountains and lakes, and landscape, but also has all of the added benefits that come with a popular, so, you know, the, the fantastic places to eat and drink. Did you know that we've got more Michelin stars than anywhere north of London? Not that we can all afford to eat in them, of course, uh, but we can we can aspire. Um, but brilliant places to eat and drink. We've got fantastic culture, fantastic heritage, and we've got every type of place to suit every pocket. And of course, we support 65,000 jobs, and they are jobs for people of every age, for women, for men, Great opportunities for young people to get work experience and get onto the career ladder as well. And then the other benefits that we sometimes overlook as well is that we then end up with people who've chosen to come and live here, which help our local shops, our local schools, our local pubs, all to succeed. And I, actually, I could go on because I think about the farming industry and the opportunities, the changes that are happening in the farming industry and the opportunities that tourism provides for diversification, which in turn helps to maintain some of that landscape. So the positives are, are vast. You know, that's sort of talking about it from an inward perspective. From the visitor perspective, we all know from spending time in the county and 
how good that makes us feel. You know, the, the stress that drops away, the health and the well-being associated with being in a landscape like that. And we're a fantastically welcoming county as well. And we give those people a wonderful experience and memories that live on and hopefully um, just push them through that next period until they're able to visit again. And I think that's what we're all, because we recognise how stunning and amazing Cumbria and the Lake District is, and that's why we're all quite keen on making it sustainable and looking after that environment. So what are the biggest or what is the biggest tourist related sustainability challenge that is facing Cumbria at the moment? At the moment is, is the sort of um, key part, isn't it? What I would have said to you probably before the last year would have been probably around public transport and um, trying to encourage as many people as possible to use public transport. And Cumbria Tourism was involved in a fantastic project, the National Park and other partners called Go Lakes Travel some years ago, a government funded project, which was really successful in terms of um, moving people onto um, public transport, sustainable means of transport, whether that be boat, bike, foot, rail, as well as buses, horses, even, I think even segways these days. And that has always been something that we've wanted to not just maintain, but grow the number of people that actually think having a sustainable journey through the county is part of the experience of being on holiday and ditching the car. Clearly that's become nigh on impossible, much more challenging because of the government directive through COVID. Interestingly, Stagecoach reported some pretty healthy figures on their through the lakes routes during the summer because they were able to provide really COVID safe distancing um, and experiences. So it is interesting that there is still that appetite for it. And we know that Windermere Lake Cruises and all sorts of steamers, etc., also offer lots of um, cross lake journeys letting people get from one place to the other. I guess, you know, the challenge that everybody's been talking about last summer and and likely to come again this summer is the um, impact of lockdown and what that's meant in terms of our inability to get out and about and to just get away from our own localities. And if if you're lucky, like we are, to live in a lovely locality, we still had that wonderful opportunity to get that health and wellbeing kick. But if you are somebody that's living in a city, in a more built-up area, how much more must you need that opportunity to get to a place like ours? And, and of course, because Scotland and Wales had slightly different restrictions that were going on at slightly different times because of the limitations around international travel, all of those things combined with this short window of opportunity created last summer exceptional demand And then to sort of go back on that, the businesses themselves were restricted in terms of their own capacities and how many people they could take. Public service provision was restricted. So it was a really challenging year. And I think that under the circumstances, the agencies, if I can call them that, so that would be, you know, ourselves, um, the local local authorities, county council, Lake District National Park, police, Mountain Rescue, National Trust, all those sorts of organisations work really well under very extreme circumstances to try to mitigate as much as possible. Now, that said, we've learned a lot from last year's experience. And the good news is that we've been able to plan much more in advance in order to do even more work to try and mitigate that. I'll just cut back one second to say that when we did a visitor survey in September to ask what visitors thought of the place, 99% said they felt that they'd had a fantastic experience, that they had been very much welcomed. Um, A lot of those visitors were new visitors with an appetite and desire to come back. So some of those are people that might have been as kids, but as adults and with their children, they know chosen to go off somewhere else. Last year gave them the opportunity to come back and realise actually we've been missing something. But obviously that creates challenge and, you know, for the individual businesses and and for us as a county in terms of how we manage that. But we've got a plan. I think this summer we're probably going to experience something similar. A lot of people will be coming to the Lake District. What can visitors themselves do to be more environmentally friendly or sustainable, given that there's going to be, I imagine, huge volumes of people? Yeah, I think the first thing that I would say is I think the vast majority of people are, 
you know, people who wish to come and be responsible visitors and to contribute to the economy and to support, you know, not to offend communities in any way. So I think the vast majority of people do do that. But there's all of us have opportunities to take responsibility. I think that, you know, the whole environmental priorities are higher up the agenda. The more that any of us can do to reduce our carbon footprint, clearly better. Um, and, and a lot of our messaging and working is about that. It will depend to a certain extent from a public transport perspective what the government guidance is at that point. But it looks as though from the roadmap that that will ease as we come towards the peak season for, for tourism. I think it's, you know, listen to Mark, you know, even Mark saying that he, when he was, you know, on a foul, he, you know, he nearly ran into trouble there. Um, someone as experienced as you can run into trouble there. Then I think it is the responsibility of all of us to make sure that we are not trying to do something beyond our capabilities, whether that's on the water, whether it's up the mountain, that we're taking the right advice, got the right equipment. And like Mark said, knowing when it's time to say, actually, today's not the right day to do that. We are part of a program called Adventure Smart, which is started in Wales, actually. And it's all about advising and supporting visitors to think smart before they um, attempt to do something that perhaps they've never done before in the pouring rain or a thunderstorm, as Mark describes. One of the other things that I think that visitors can do is give. Um, so there's a fantastic charity in the Lake District called the Lake District Foundation, which is all about taking funding, if you like, from the visitor um, and putting that back into projects like Fix the Fells um, or, or Wildlife Project. I think that's really important and we're a key partner and supporter of that. The businesses themselves, so many of our businesses are, they're local people and they live in the communities and their staff live and work in the communities and they're very mindful um, of wanting to be a responsible business within that community. So you'll see many businesses these days that have very strong green credentials. You look at somewhere like the Quiet Side at Ullswater, all the projects that they've done to make themselves an incredibly um, successful and um, sustainable tourism business. And actually part of their USP now is because they are like that. And there's much more of that that's going to follow now because actually the consumer's demanding it, but also the government's driving that as well. And, and then the other, the, 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 so much here, isn't there? The, the other thing for me is that you don't have to visit in the summer. You know, we are an all year round destination. And actually, Cumbria is a huge county. And as Mark's just said, you know, it doesn't take too much effort to get away from the crowds. You can be in Windermere and find places where you won't see a soul even on an August bank holiday. So I think it's just being mindful of that, about being respectful to the communities that you're, that whom you're staying within. I think it's about leaving no trace when you are here and giving something back, perhaps through the Lake District Foundation, so that we can, you know, continue to maintain this stunning environment for everybody's benefit. Just going back to your point though about you know the summer, I think the big message, and this isn't just in, in this county, it's countrywide, is know before you go, plan ahead, book ahead. You know, if you want to come and camp in the county, make sure you've got a pitch before you come. You know, make sure that you've booked what it is you want to do, attractions wise as well. And there's loads and loads of ideas on lakedistrict.com of itineraries and things to do, things that you can book right across the county you know from the coast it's we we've we coined it then the 2021 Cumbrian year of the coast there's obviously Hadrian's Wall there's the lovely Pennine stretch Morecambe Bay as well as the central lake district so it's you know really think and plan out your journey and book before you come to be guaranteed um, a fantastic experience That's brilliant. There's a question, and I'm not sure whether actually you'll be able to answer this, Mark, because I think it might be an addition just for the new books. But have you seen any of the paths going from green to red as a result of your books, as would happen as, sorry, that happened with Wainwright, apparently, in terms of the terrain? But I, I think they're, they're a new addition just for this series, aren't they? Yeah, we'll know more in 10 years time, perhaps. We will have to be on our toes to respond to Fix the Fells and so forth. And if we see that we are responsible for any exacerbation of the paths, then we will change some orientations to, to respond better. 
So as yet, we're too young in the tooth, as it were, to have that impact. I don't want to have an impact, quite frankly, but the Fells will, we are just about at the cusp of probably five years, intensive fell walking interest in the Lake District, which it's been popular for years, but suddenly people won't be able to go abroad. They won't go to the Alps in the same number, but they will come to the Lake District. And so it's going to be right at this sharp end. And this series will have to take its the brunt of criticism. People are so much more mindful now, aren't they, um, of their own health and their well-being. And when you're producing a guide as helpful and user-friendly um, and accessible as this, then actually what we're doing here is we're making it possible for more people to explore and experience safely. So, you know, that's fantastic, that's great, but as you say, we have to be mindful. You have to have broad shoulders and be aware that you've got to respond. And uh, our, like your spirit of wanting to disperse people, here is will do, within the National Park, the wider Cumbria equally needs to be respected. The wider Cumbria has wonderful places, but within the context of this, we do spread the load. I sort of wanted to ask, well, where would you suggest people go? for a quieter experience. But that's almost not the question to ask, is it? Because as soon as you say, oh, go to this place and everyone goes there, then you've just moved the problem elsewhere, haven't you? But I, I suppose what you might say is, you know, rather than just going to Keswick or Ambleside, because those are the places you've heard of. Well, because you, you have the Western Lakes, because it's more challenging to get to, there's always going to be scope for visitors in Estale, Oh, the wild upper re reaches of Estale. I think everybody who loves the Lake District, the wild fells, adores Upper Estale. And it's like being in the highlands of Scotland. Mardale, ahead of Horswater, you're right into the, the glens of Scotland there. I know Wainwright loved it up there. I think people who are connoisseurs of the fells know those places. And they'll find them in our guides if they buy all eight, scrutinise them they'll find these magical places and then invariably not where the honeypots are. Interestingly, I think what happens as well, I mean, we measure economic impacts of the visitor economy every year and year on year we've seen growth in areas like the West Coast, at Hadrian's Wall, that, that kind of area, those kind of areas more convey. They've all seen good incremental growth. What happened last year is because we had such a significant portion of um, people who were coming for the first time or first time as adults, they go to the places that they've heard of, that they know, because they feel safe and secure that they're going to get a good experience. But then what they say to us is, actually, we've done that, we've had a brilliant time, we want to do that again, but actually we want to explore something else as well. So often when we talk to repeat visitors, They've either mixed and matched with known and new, or they've gone for just new. And actually, that's fantastic. That's fantastic for both economies and communities right across the county. And, and Jill, where are you most looking forward to going when we can all get out and about and travel freely in the Lake District again? Where are you most looking forward to going? Well, I had a plan last October half term when I had a week off to really explore the coast. And there were so many days out, that, days out that we had planned, and obviously that couldn't happen. It's a Cumbria year of the coast, so I'm going to be heading over to the coast. However, I also, I've got a dog now, and uh, me and my husband and the dog, the kids are getting a bit too grown up and don't want to come with us, so me and my husband and the dog are just looking forward to getting out and walking on the fell. So I'll be picking up your books, Mark. I'll be bagging, bagging him out, fell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, a benchmark fell, yes, that's it. Uh, a few, actually, not one, a few. <laughs> a few. It's very important to remember that the, they don't belong to anybody, they belong to you, whoever you are. <laughs> Marvellous. Thank you both so much for joining me to celebrate the Fell Rangers and yeah, to talk about sustainable walking in the Lake District. And I know that all three of us are looking forward to getting out there again and welcoming people back this summer when they can come. Thank you, Amy, and thank you, Jill. Thank you, and congratulations again on a fantastic series. Enjoy them, everybody. Thank you for listening to this latest episode of Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast. Let us know what you think by leaving reviews on your podcast platform or emailing us live at cicerone.co.uk. We'd really love to hear from you. 
Visit www.ciceron.co.uk to find over a thousand articles, sign up to our newsletter or buy one of our guidebooks. You can subscribe to the podcast on your favourite podcast provider. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. So in the meantime, search for at Cicerone Press on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And you can also join our Facebook community group, Cicerone Connect, to connect with other outdoor enthusiasts. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you soon.